Hey, good morning. Hey, join me in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. That's in the New Testament, about halfway through the New Testament. So uh, if I ask you a question, right? If I come to you and I say, tell me what a mature Christian looks like. How would you answer that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times what we might answer that is, well, that's some gray-haired people in the church. They're mature believers. Yeah, and you're probably not wrong, but, uh, but we also get this mindset of what that perfect Christian looks like. We're like, oh, they're the ones who really know the Bible, and they're really good at Bible trivia, and boy, they can hammer out those answers. You know, we get that. We get the ones who can wax eloquent in prayer, you know, and they can just like call down heaven in their prayers, and you feel that. And you're like, wow, that's a matured believer, or somebody that's always got that Bible answer for everything. Yeah, that's kind of what we think about when we think about matured believers. But I think at our core, all of our answers are basically right here. It's anything but me. Right? Because, I mean, we come to church sometimes, and if we're going to be honest, we can get around some other believers, and it seems really intimidating. We can get around some other people that seem like they've got it all together. Their life has no problems. You know, they're just always uh, uh, happy-go-lucky. Boy, they're always bouncing off the ceiling. They're always doing their thing. And we look at our own lives, and we're going, man, I have my up times, but boy, I have my down times too. I have my victories, but I also have my struggles. I have, you know, and we're, we're kind of in that camp, but we're looking around all the happy, smiling Christians who seem to have all of it together, and we're transported, really, some of you are still here, but you're transported back to high school where you're the kid in class, everybody else has their homework done, everybody else understands, and you're trying to figure out what the name of the class even is. That's where we find ourselves a lot of times in our Christianity. And we wonder what gives. Why am I not getting it that these other people are? I mean, it seems like the new believers, I mean, this guy's been a Christian for like three weeks and he seems better at it than I am. You ever been there? We seem to, to or maybe there was a time in your life where you were growing pretty well, but that's kind of filtered out, you know, and now we're just kind of going through motions, doing our things, and that original passion that we had for Jesus is now gone. I mean, is that daily walk with Jesus? Is that maturity place in Christ? Is that only for the select chosen few out here? And it's just, I'm just going to have to go through my life with just a little Jesus while they get all the Jesus. You know, is that how it is? Do you desire to grow? Do you want to grow in your faith? If you're looking around and you're seeing other believers and it's like, man, that, I see a difference in my life. They seem to be getting it. I'm not, guess what? You're not weird, at least not because of that. You're able to look into other people's lives and see that. It creates a hunger within you. you know, I look back on my grandmother's life, and I thought a lot about my grandmother this week because the other day I was in Groundhouse Coffee, big surprise, and I'm sitting here working on this sermon, and I'm doing my little thing here, and I'm glued in right here, and I hear one of the baristas, she, she says, ooh, I like your dress. So I look up, and there's this young girl, and she's wearing a dress that looked just like the dress my grandma wore to church every Sunday. So I decided not to say anything. <laughs> Sometimes the filter works. <laughs> but uh, she walked out, and I was, I was just, uh, and my daughter was there, so we just started talking about my grandma. And you know, the thing about my grandmother's faith is very instrumental in my life, but it's not because she just sat me down and, and told me about the faith. I watched the faith she modeled. I heard her pray. I watched her in the scriptures. Now, yes, I had to watch those Jesus cartoons about the flying house. Anybody remember that one? Yeah, I had to do that. I had to do all this. I was in Sunday school. I was in church. I was in all, all that. But I watched my grandma live it out. And it created a hunger in me. So when we watch faith, we see it going out there, it creates in us a desire to grow. We're made with a desire to grow. We see the concept of growth all around us right now. Some of us are struggling right now with allergies because of the growth we see around us, right? It's there. It's not any different in your Christian life either. You're created, if you're born again, you have a desire to grow in Jesus. We want to be more. We want to follow him. We want to get there. But here's the big question. What are we growing into, right? I mean, we're, we're, if we're growing, we say, yeah, I want to grow in Jesus. What are we growing into exactly? Some of us are just growing into church members. And yes, there's a difference between a church member and a Christian. 
There's a difference in the growing of those things. Jesus wants us to grow into Christians. A lot of us are satisfied growing into church members. As a church member, you'll learn the songs, you'll sit on the chair, you'll throw your money in a plate, you'll learn the lingo, you'll make friends, you'll uh, influence people, I don't know, whatever else we're gonna do. We're gonna do all that, but as a Christian, you will model Jesus Christ. As a Christian, you will grow in your love of Jesus. You will grow as you reflect Jesus. You will live a transformed life in Jesus, and you will make a difference in your world for Jesus. That's what he's calling us to live. That's the object of our growth. As a Christian, you will be one who follows Jesus, reflects Jesus, loves Jesus, experience the resurrection power of Jesus in your life so that what was death in you becomes life in you. What should have destroyed you now is a testimony to his greatness and what he can do. The, that we are no longer um, ashamed of our past, but now we embrace it as a testimony to what God does. Church, do you want that kind of life? If you don't, then we need to have a whole different conversation. Okay? But if we are sitting here today and we're to say, this is what I want in my Christianity, then we have to accept the challenge to grow. <laughs> We've got to accept that. So today we're starting a brand new sermon series called Grow, right? That's what we want to do. The last several weeks, now, those of you that have been here for any length of time, you know me now. I've been here 12 years. Some of you have been here that long. Some of you have not. But let me catch you up if you haven't figured this out yet. I do not preach 49 sermons a year. I preach one sermon that takes 49 weeks to get through. Okay? That's what I do. So you really don't want to miss church. Okay? <laughs> but we talked a few months ago about saved. What does it mean to be a Christian? And then we just finished the series, Daria, on taking that salvation and living it out, you know, in such a way where you will be more than you in a culture that tells you just be you. You're going to be more than you. You'll reflect Jesus. You'll engage his mission, and you will continue to grow even when it's hard as an active, living part of what he's doing, right? Now we got to bridge that gap and see how we get there. Because sometimes it seems there's a really long way between getting saved and living Christ. The Grow series is where we start. Guys, we are going to talk about over the next several weeks how to read your Bible, how to pray and develop that prayer life, how to worship God in a way that helps you grow in your faith and honor him, how to leave that old life behind and find those death points in your life and bring them to the cross and his resurrection to find life now, and how to be, you know, how to do all these things, how to live in community with other Christians and, and, and how these things influence and affect your life, not just that we should, but how to do it. However... Before we get there, we've got to plant some seeds. We've got to get a foundation for how we're going to build on this. And that's where we start today. In the book of Galatians, Paul is telling this church here in Galatia, they started well. I mean, they were the guys going, yeah, let's grow, let's do this thing. But they veered from the simple faith a little bit. They started adopting Judaism, kind of like the modern-day Jewish roots movement. Yeah, they kind of drifted back into that stuff. And Paul's going, whoa, guys, what are you doing? Come on back. Get out of that. You know, he's calling them back to this. And I think a lot of times in our culture, we buy into a lot of other things too. And so Paul, in the last chapter of Galatians, begins to tell the church, this is what you need to do. This is that foundational principle in order that you may continue to build on your faith. And that's where we're going to start today. Now, when we grasp these foundational principles of how to sow into your faith, all of what we're going to talk about today is going to be very key to how we go forward. Because if you're, trying to, uh, if you're trying to get in your Bible and you're trying to pray and you're trying to do all these other things, without this, you're going to find it very lacking. You're going to find it frustrating. You're going to find that place where you're not growing and you think you ought to be. And that's where people throw their hands up and they're like, well, I tried being a Christian and that just didn't work for me. That's where you find that. So that's why we have to start with these foundational principles to grow your faith. Let's see what Paul talks about in verse 6. Very first up value your faith. Value your faith. He says here, let the one who is taught in the word share all good things with the one who teaches. That's where he starts you. He says, listen guys, if you are being taught the word of God, then share physical things with the one who is teaching you. No, the staff isn't looking for more money. <laughs> but what he's talking about here is something pretty powerful. He's asking you, this church, he's challenging them. You say you value your faith. Are you willing to sow physically into it? That's where he starts here. 
He's saying you, you, the ones who are teaching you the word, they're committed to sharing the word. They're committed to selling the word. Are you committed to see to their needs? Now, here's the bigger picture of what he's getting at. This is a value transfer. He's asking them, and I'm asking you, do you value your spiritual life as much as you value physical things? Is that value system there? Because in our culture, far too often, we value the physical and minimize the spiritual. And I promise you this, church, we live in a culture that has greatly exaggerated the value of passing away things. But it's what we do, right? So the question is, if we are going to truly grow in our faith, we have to understand that we must value our faith. We've got to value our spiritual life. We've got to place a value upon it that lifts it above what we say we value in the physical. Now, I don't know about you, but I do value physical things, okay? I'm not going to lie, full transparency up here. I'm a human too. I'm going to confess this before all of you just so you know we're all on the same page. I'm hungry right now. I'm already thinking about lunch, you know? I'm sitting here like, Jesus, eat lunch, Jesus, lunch, Jesus, lunch, Jesus, Jesus. I, I got to talk Jesus right now. We'll do lunch later, but lunch, <laughs> You know, we get into that base, right? I mean, that's, that's where we are sometimes, okay? There are physical things that are good. We need to value them. You should value people. You should value your family. You should value your work so that you put a good amount of effort into it. However, what this scripture is telling us to do is that same level of value, you roll that into your spiritual life. Do you value growing as a Christian? Because if you do not value it, you will never apply yourself to it. You'll never take time for it. You'll never, everything else will come up. And that, you know, why don't we value it more? I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, we value too many other things, right? I mean, guys, we all only have so much bandwidth, okay? We are not unlimited up here, all right? I know some of us think we are. We are not, right? If you think you're unlimited, just think about how there are numbers involved in math as well as letters somehow, you know? You will find that you are very limited, okay? Watch a cat and try to understand how people like those things. I told somebody I would do that yesterday, okay? But you see my point. We're limited. Guys, you can't chase everything on this planet, okay? You just can't do it. We cannot chase down all these things that culture has told us we should value. I mean, we value in this, I mean, we value money too much, right? We think we got to have it in order to be happy. We value what society tells us we're supposed to think about ourselves. I mean, we have put a whole value system upon what some, I mean, we have this TikTok mentality these days. Yeah, we're TikToking up here where we got somebody who, who, who has this much, uh, this much knowledge of a subject and that much time on their hands, and they tell us what we ought to value and think about things, and they're, they're wrong, but yet we soak it in. And we pursue it and we chase it. People say, this is what you need to be happy. And we chase that. People say, no, you must have this and you must have this. And we start valuing all this. And then we don't have enough value bandwidth left to give to Jesus. And so that goes away. Guys, let me ask you, what is your value? Where do you spend your time? Where do you invest your energy? It's going to be on what you value. There's an old saying, old saying, that if you want to see what you truly value, look at your calendar and your checking account. That shows you what you truly value. Where are you putting your time? Where are you putting your resources? And Paul's telling the church at Galatia, and he's telling us too, you got to put that same level of value on Christ, on your relationship with Jesus or else it will not grow because you will conform to what you worship. And what you value most is what you worship. So we value too many other things. The second thing is we don't understand what God is offering us. If we understood what it is that Jesus is giving to us, then we would see the value. We would understand. Guys, it is your faith that anchors you in this life. It is your faith that pleases God. It is your faith in God as you wrap your hands on him and you hold tight to him that lets no matter what comes into your life, you stand firm. And it's not just doing that. It's knowing who he is. It's experiencing his life. It's the fact that he takes what is death and brings life to it all through your faith. It's why Satan attacks your faith. It's why everything in this life is designed to destroy faith. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark. That's wishful thinking, and God doesn't bless wishful thinking. 
Faith is a reasoned response to his revealed word. And when we begin to value that, we can cry out with a psalmist in Psalm 119. He says, I rise before dawn and I cry for help. I hope in your words. You hear that? I rise before the dawn? I'm not telling you that's when you have to do your quiet time, okay? But here's what I am saying. What the psalmist is saying is Jesus more important to me than my sleep, more important to me than anything else, more important to me than my breakfast, more important to me than that first cup of coffee is you. And I've got to grab you, Jesus, daily. Do you understand that value? Here's a quick value test. What are you willing to do to grow in your faith? And secondly, what are you willing to give up in order to grow in your faith? Those two things will tell on you real quick because he's saying value it, value it. And I promise you, as we get into it next week, we start learning how to read this Bible and have that quiet time with God and grow from it as we do that. If you do not value him, you will not stick to that. If you don't value him, you won't continue to be faithful in your service because we got a value system that's way messed up. First, you've got to value your faith. Second foundational principle, you must take responsibility for your faith. Oh, that one stinks. You mean, Joey, I can't get everything I need about Jesus right here in this like hour that I'm here? No, Jesus is way too big for that. (laughs) Guys, when we come to church, let me explain what church is. This is the congregational uh, uh, corporate time that we come together and we worship our God. That's what this is for. We hear his word. Why? So we can say amen and go eat some chicken. (laughs) No. (laughs) It's so that we can leave this place and apply the teachings. You see, guys, when we are here today, we're here to celebrate what God has done in eternity past in sending his son Jesus to die on a cross. We're here to celebrate the fact that that guy rose from the dead three days later for our salvation. We are here today to celebrate what God has done in our lives last Monday through yesterday, and we are here to prepare and get equipped for what is God is going to do tomorrow through Saturday, and we'll come back next week and do it all over again. Guys, that's what we're here today to do. During the week, your Monday through Saturday, that's when you grow in your faith. And you must take responsibility for that faith. Look, listen to what he says later on. He says in verse 7, he says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. He says, God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap, right? Some translations, some different languages of this text say everything you sow, you will reap. If you put it in the ground, that's what's going to come up. Anybody garden? You got a garden, right? Coming to your house later. But anyways, you get the garden right there. If I go outside and I plant tomatoes in my backyard, guess what I expect to grow? I mean, I wouldn't expect anything to grow because I'm doing it, but if someone were skilled and they go out here and they plant the tomatoes, you expect the tomatoes to come up, right? That's what you expect to happen. If I planted tomatoes and I come back out later and I've got corn growing here, something went wrong. It was either the wrong seed or it was the wrong seed (laughs) because tomatoes don't grow into corn, right? And that's what he's getting at here. Church, as we take responsibility for our faith, we must sow the right thing. If we, you cannot sow physically into your life and expect to reap spiritually. It doesn't work that way. You can't give your life to the job and never to Jesus and expect to grow spiritually. You cannot just gather here on a Sunday morning and expect me to divvy out the word to you and make it rain Jesus and you walk out of here and now you're good. It doesn't work. You must take responsibility for your own faith to sow into yourself the word of God. Not man's opinion, not TikTok, not all this stuff. It's the word of God we sow into us. That is the seed that Jesus spreads. That is the seed that Jesus gives. And that is what reaps a harvest of eternal life. Anything else. So that comes to question, what are you sowing into your life? Who's getting the loudest voice in your ear? Is it your past? Is it what they are telling you you ought to be living for? Is it your own estimations of what is good and wrong and right and whatever else? Or are you listening to him? 
Because if we're taking in all culture, culture, culture all the time, do not expect Jesus to sprout in your life from that. But you might be sitting here going, wait a minute, Joey, I am sowing a whole lot of Jesus in me. I mean, I, I'm doing the thing, but I'm not seeing growth. Well, what kind of soil are we putting it into? You know, are we putting it in, into a soil that's just trying to check boxes? Yep, I did my quiet time today, read my chapter a day to keep the devil away. I did that. Let me do that. Uh, somebody heard me pray. That was awesome. I, I witnessed for Jesus by praying over my hamburger at Sonic in my car where nobody saw me, but it's okay because it's Jesus. You know, we're trying to, the soil's important too. And what God is looking for over and over again, we find it in scripture, is a heart that is willing to serve, a heart that is pliable for him, that he makes through the new covenant of his spirit inside of us. Are we sowing into a willingness to grow? Are we sowing into a willingness to obey? We've got to plant God's word into a soil that anticipates growth and transformation that is yielded to obedience. So how do we take that responsibility? Number one, be Bereans, right? You know what a Berean is? That's a biblical word. It was a biblical town, Berea, from the book of Acts. As Paul was teaching the Bereans, we find that those Bereans, you know what they did? The Bible said they were more noble than the rest because they went home and they studied their Bible. Paul gets up and he says this. They go back to their Old Testament and they're like, hey, he's right. Okay, good. You know, that's the idea. Guys, we must get in the word. We must get around other people, other believers, get in our small groups and our grace groups and our, our, that, that Tyler will be talking about real soon. Yeah, you know, we're getting into those types of areas where we can sow together and study the word of God together and, and be in this thing together, studying daily, taking your own responsibility in that. But secondly, you gotta make time. You've got to make time. If you are too busy for God, then you are busier than God wants you to be. And you are busier than God will bless. Mm. Guys, we've got to make sure that we are walking with Jesus. You know, a lot of times in our culture, we want to, we want to uh, uh, kind of lower the bar a little bit because we're thinking, man, people just won't make that kind of time. We've got to lower the bar. Jesus pretty, pretty high bar up there. He said, lay down your life and come after me. That's a pretty big bar to reach. But he said, if you don't do it, you can't be my disciple. Right? <laughs> So we've got to take that responsibility and go after our Jesus as hard as we can. And you say, well, Joey, man, that seems like a really big thing. Listen, consistent small steps are better than occasional large ones. Anybody remember that Bill Murray movie, What About Bob? You know, the baby steps? Remember that? We just need to take a bunch of baby steps in this thing. But take that responsibility and say, I'm going to study my scripture. And you know what? I was going to read two chapters a day. I missed my two chapters yesterday. Don't try to read four chapters tomorrow. Just pick back up with two. Get right in. Just flow. And let God begin to bless you. Why is this so important? Because sowing into him. He says the opposite of destruction is eternal life. As we sow his life into us, it erases death in us. And we've got to embrace him for that. So let's value our faith. Let's take responsibility for our faith. Third, let's patiently persevere in our faith. Patiently persevere. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 9. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we'll reap if we don't give up. Some of you may be sitting here and you're going, man, I am, I've been doing stuff, Joey. Where's my growth? Where's my growth? You know, remember when you were a kid and everything was so exciting? I mean, you were, uh, uh, you're a kid and you're like, uh, uh, it's August 10th. And you're, so you ask the kid, how old are you? And the kid's like, oh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be eight next August the 8th. You know, they're like a year away, but they're going to tell you that's their age, right? They're so excited to grow. We get that way too. And it can be real easy for us to get impatient with our growth when we're looking at how other people appear to us to be right? And catch the way I worded that, appear to us to be. And Satan will use that against you. He'll tell you, no, nah, you're not growing right. You're not, this isn't working for you. Stop. Maybe you're leading a ministry and it's not taken off the way you thought it would. And he comes to you, the enemy, and he says, stop. Something hits you hard in life. Something you didn't expect. And he comes at you and he says, stop. And far too many of us give up in that moment. Church, remember, this is, not a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. 
God the eternal is working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure, the scripture says. And sometimes that's going to look like leaps and bounds growth. Sometimes it's going to be the slow route. But either way, God is doing something in you. So many times we're tempted to quit. We're tempted to stop. And you need to stop for a second and go, when, when I am tempted, why am I tempted? Right? I mean, really, whenever you're tempted to stop, and you will be, you will be, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. Number one, go, why do I want to quit? Why do I want to quit? <laughs> why do you want to quit? Well, Joey, it got hard. I hit something in the Bible I didn't understand. You know, somebody at church did it. Oh, man, we are so evil in the churches. You know? I had, I had someone who was an atheist one time tell me, you know why I don't believe in God? Because some Christian was a jerk to me once. And I said, well, I don't believe in not God because some atheist was a jerk to me once. <laughs> she didn't want to talk after that. But yeah, life hurts. Well, I want to quit because, because there's just, I just got to apply myself more to over here right now. But we could keep going with our things right there. But when you're asking yourself, why do I want to quit? I want you to run back to something. I promise you, your desire to quit is more based on your weakness than it is God's strength. We need to pull back to that. After you've said, why do I want to quit? Oh, man, Jesus is awesome. Now remember the purpose. Go back to that purpose. What's the purpose? The purpose in growing in your faith is not to, be, is not to have all your stuff together right? It's not so that all of life will go rainbows and unicorns and skittles and coffee and cookies for me, right? That's not the point. The point is Christ's likeness. It's to be like him. Remember that. Because here's the, listen guys, if we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be like him, then do not be surprised when friends stab you in the back. How can we be like him if we don't experience what he experienced? A man who is acquainted with griefs and sorrows from Isaiah 53. How can we be like him if we are not also acquainted with griefs and sorrows? How can we be like him if we never have to forgive? How can we be like him, right? If we don't sow into people who reject, how can we be like him? The point is Christ's likeness. And then just celebrate some baby steps, man. There is nothing wrong with going to God and saying, God, thank you that I'm learning. Thank you that I'm growing. Thank you that, that, yeah, I messed up yesterday, but I didn't mess up today. I don't know about tomorrow yet, but I thank you for today. There's a whole different ball game than going to God and going, God, I'm awesome, thanks. That's wrong. Okay, that's messed up. Don't do that. But to go to God and simply thank him for what he's doing in your life helps us to see that it's not time to quit. It's time to sow in. I promise you in Joseph's life, remember Joseph from the Old Testament, Genesis? He had a dream that he was going to be ruler and, and all this kind of stuff, and it wasn't happening for him. In fact, he uh, got framed for rape. He got thrown into prison, sold into slavery before all that. Then he was promised, hey, I'll remember you and get you out of here. Two years later, the guy remembered, got him out. <laughs> I promise you in that whole process, he thought about quitting. But yet he remembered what God had said, what God had done. He watched what God was doing, and then he saved the world through those things that he suffered. To the point that he was able to tell his brothers what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Don't stop. Keep growing. Fourth, lastly here, practice obedience to your faith. Practice obedience. This is the part that holds it all together. Look in verse 10. It says, so then, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know, let's be obedient together. You know, this is what holds the whole thing together. You, if you value your faith, you will take responsibility for it. And if you're valuing it, you're responsible for it, you won't quit. You will persevere in it. And as you're persevering, it leads us into obedience. As we look around and see opportunity, we must obey our faith. The Bible tells us over and over, and we'll get into all this, guys, that we are not to be hearers only, but doers of our faith. It's not, we can't just come and soak it in on a Sunday and come back next Sunday and soak in some more. We must be obedient. Do what he says. Here's the reality. Why is it so important? I'm not preaching here a works-based salvation. 
I am preaching a genuine salvation evidenced by good works. That's what the scripture says. In fact, the only test we have for genuine Christianity is a transformed life resulting in obedience to the, to the word. That's what we get. Are we being obedient? Because here's what Jesus talked about in, in Luke 13. He gives this parable about a, a fig tree, and the owner comes by, and he says, man, I don't ever see fruit on this thing. Get it out of here. And another servant pops up and goes, wait, wait. Let me dig around it. Let me put some fertilizer down. Let me work on it. Let's see what happens. And if a year goes by, ain't nothing, we'll get it out of here. That's a very illustration of Jesus' teaching in John 15, where he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruits will be cut down and thrown out. What? Here's the thing. If, why would God continue to grow and sow in us if we are being willingly disobedient to everything he's planting in. Church, if we want to see genuine growth in our life, we must become obedient to what he is saying. And here's a very safe place to do that. Like I said, church is that place where we come and we corporately gather to worship. It's a very safe place. That's why he says, especially to those of the household of faith. You know, we get to come and practice this obedience here because it's a safe spot. I guarantee you, at least I hope not, you're not going to go up to anybody here and go, will you pray for me? And they're going to look at you and go, ew, get away. <laughs> then we got to have other conversations too. <laughs> Nobody's going to come up to you and say, hey, I'm, I've been praying for you. And they're going to look at you and go, oh, well, quit it. Just get away. I don't believe in that stuff. Hopefully that's not going to happen here, right? It's a safe place to serve. It's a safe place to gather and practice our faith. Because, yeah, we're going to make messes of it sometimes, right? We're going to do it wrong sometimes. We're going to hurt people we're trying to help. We are going to make a fool of ourselves sometimes when we're really trying to make Jesus look good. But what do we do? We don't grow weary in our doing well. We keep moving. We keep growing. Church, make sure. Make sure. Now, some of this stuff, guys, yes, calling us to a higher level. It's calling us to place a value somewhere we may not have valued before. To actually take some responsibility for our own spiritual growth in the connection with, other, with the community of the believers. Maybe it's time for us. Some of you are thinking right now, man, I was just about to stop. Maybe now I keep going. Maybe I do this. And some of you, God's been putting something on your heart that you need to do for a while. Now it's time to do it and to get obedient to him so that your growth is not stunted. Right? And we're going to spend the next several weeks talking about how to grow in our faith. But you've got to get these four foundational principles down. Now, as we begin growing, uh, as we begin growing next week, I want to give you some tips to manage your expectations a little bit. Okay? And I'll hit these pretty quickly. But first, uh, spiritual growth does not make us immune to challenges. Don't think that because you're growing in Jesus, your life's going to get nice and easy. That is not the thing. In fact, hear me on this. A call to grow is a call to arms. A call to grow is a call to arms. If you begin to value your faith, take responsibility for it, commit to not quit, and commit to obedience, Satan is coming after you. You just made his target zone. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We stand fast. Hold on to him, right? But secondly... Spiritual highs do not last. Spiritual highs do not last. What do I mean by that? You know, it's very easy to go to a camp or go to a retreat or go to a, a, a good church service, you know, or go to any of these things and go, wow, I have tasted Jesus. And then you leave always wanting that again, always wanting that experience again, even weighing spiritual things based on did I get that buzz again? If that's you, I want to caution you, your God is the buzz, not Jesus. And you need to understand that. You need to put more of a value on him than on an emotional experience. Because yes, our emotions are very much part of our faith. It is an emotional faith. I enjoy my time with God. I enjoy doing this. I enjoy sitting with you guys, and I enjoy, I enjoy these things, right? But I love this quote I came across uh, recently. I didn't write down who said it, but I didn't say it, but I like it. He says, how I spend this ordinary day in Christ is how I will spend my Christian life. How I spend this ordinary day in Christ is how I will spend my Christian life. You know, we don't live for Jesus for those highs. 
We live for Jesus, for Jesus. That's why. And we let him lead us in life. So those highs, yeah, you're going to have them, but they will come down. You're going to have those quiet times in Jesus we'll talk about over the next few weeks. And boy, you're, the, the, the light's going to shine down. Probably not really unless you've got a light bulb issue. But something's going to happen here. Things are going to, man, you're going to get up ready to take on the world. And then tomorrow you're going to read and shut the book and pray. <laughs> you know what? Both of those things are good. Why? Because God is working. And here's what this faith will do, guys. You take this thing seriously. Abraham, Abraham left everything for a better inheritance. Moses left being a, 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 a shepherd out in the wilderness to nothing, to being the great redeemer of Israel. David was a little shepherd boy who ascended to be a king. Peter was a fisherman who became a man fisher. Yeah, Paul was a comfy Pharisee who, in, who was put into prison for the rest of his life. Martin Luther had a cushy job teaching and then spent the rest of his life hiding for fear of being murdered. You say, Joey, those last couple of examples probably weren't very good. <laughs> you missed the point. When we begin to grow in Christ, we begin to value him. We begin to reflect him. We begin to be able to say to this world, you are behind me and Christ is before me. And we are able to say wholeheartedly, Jesus, I'm growing in you. Because church, you can grow in Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the time you've given us today to be in your word. And Father, to just hear this challenge because so often, God, we value so many of the wrong things. We value so many things that we shouldn't. God, we just don't make the time. We don't take responsibility for our faith or the faith of those around us. We see no reason. And Father, many that are living for you and striving in you, we get tired. We, we think it doesn't make a difference. We listen to the enemy and we get ready to quit. And far too many of us, we don't pull the, the trigger on that obedience because we're afraid or because we, we don't think we have what it takes. We're promising ourselves one more time, one more time, and then we'll go. God, today let us lay aside every one of those things and cleave unto you and hold you and live for you, Jesus. Father, let us drown all those things out and hear your voice and yours alone. For Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name.